are these people? I mean, I hate talking about Israel every fucking week, but um, but yeah. So basically, um, for what I understand, um, Hezbollah launched a drone strike uh, in Israel. So obviously, as a result, uh, Israel had to retaliate and mm. ended up basically setting a refugee hospital ablaze over the weekend. So uh, for obvious reasons, we cannot show any of the footage because one, yeah. two graphics, even for me, YouTube and all of that. Um, yeah. Two, I wouldn't want to subject you guys to that anyway, because uh, it was literally like hell. If, if, if hell exists, that will probably be what hell would be like just as far as burning bodies basically crisping up yep. you know which was disgusting to see on twitter so um what we're going to do first uh we're going to play this new segment from cbc news uh mm -hmm. just to give some details um regarding this assault and then we'll go into an article which gives a little bit more information and some stuff that I was able to pull that, and you also helped me um, yep. in terms of what is going on on the ground there. So why don't we go yep. ahead? It is ahead. another deadly day in the Gaza Strip following a pair of Israeli airstrikes. You're looking at the aftermath of one of those strikes, which hit a hospital courtyard in the central city of Deir al-Bala. It triggered a fire that then swept through a tent camp used by displaced people. The Israeli military says it was targeting militants hiding out among the civilians. Anna Cunningham from did. London joins us now. Fucking Anna, assholes. what more do we know about these latest Israeli airstrikes in Gaza? Morning, Linda. Well, this happened in the early hours of this morning. Let's take a look at some of the footage that came out overnight. The fire from the immediate aftermath of that Israeli airstrike in central Gaza, in the Deir al-Bala district, lighting up the night sky. Now, we understand that this was in a courtyard of the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Hospital, close to these temporary tents where people have been sheltering. Uh, people tried dismantling those shelters to stop that fire spreading. Uh, we're told at least four people were reportedly killed and some 40 others injured. Now, Israel's defense forces, the IDF, has said it targeted Hamas operatives. It says we're working from a command and control complex inside the hospital. That's something that Hamas denies. Also, Linda, in northern Gaza earlier, another Israeli strike. This time, Palestinian medics uh, say at least 10 people were killed there, 30 others injured in the Jabalia refugee camp. Now, that was being used, we're told, as a food distribution center. These strikes come a day after there was a drone strike in the Al-Shati camp in northern Gaza. That reportedly killed five children. Also in central Nuzerat camp, there was a school there that was being used as a shelter. And we're told that was hit by a volley of artillery. At least 22 people, including 15 children, reportedly killed there. Uh, Linda, the IDF hasn't commented on those strikes. Yeah. I mean... If you've not seen that footage on Twitter and want to subject yourself to it's it's out there, you can find it. But, you know, video of people still attached to IVs in hospital tents being burnt alive. By people, I mean 19-year-olds, women, children. Yeah. Like... Um, yeah, so... Let's get into more information about this. Uh, this article comes from New Arab. Um, let me move there you go. Over here. There we go. Um, editorial uh, that was written by the staff, uh, where they report Palestinians seen burning alive in horrifying videos following Israeli bombing of Gaza Hospital. So they continue. There you go. An Israeli strike targeting Al Qaza Martyrs Hospital in central Gaza has left an unknown number of Palestinians, many of them wounded patients, burned alive. Shocking the videos of the incident have shown. The courtyard of the hospital in Deir al Jabbar was filled with makeshift tents housing displaced Palestinians who had nowhere else to go, 
following repeated forced evacuation orders from the Israeli army in northern Gaza. Horrifying videos show planes engulfing the hospital and surrounding tents. Screams and wails could be heard in the footage. One Palestinian man who compared to be connected to an IV drip was seen burning alive, while a woman and a young girl were also seen in the same huge place. And we're going to actually speak about that boy uh, that kind of went viral uh, later. I swear to God, we can't do anything. We can't even put out the flame, no water, no civil defense. I swear we can't do anything, and people are burning in front of us, Jaza journalist Sal Salal al uh, Jafawadi said, standing before the site. I mean, that was one of the, the that was one of the things I first thing I thought of was like they've not had water or access right. to water, like to right. even put out the fires here. So, uh, let alone food, and clearly they're not allowed shelter. So, you know. Anyway, continue. Sorry. Um, That's okay. Um, the strike targeted the hospital and the surrounding courtyards at around 2 a.m. local time, while most patients and residents of the makeshift tent camp were still deep asleep. The Al Kaiser Martin's Hospital said that at least four people were killed and 40 others wounded, some of them seriously. It was already struggling to treat victims of an earlier Israeli strike on a nearby school where people were sheltering nearby, and at which at least 20 people were killed. According to the Gaza-based government media office, this was the seventh Israeli attack on the Al-Qaeda Martyrs Hospital. Online, activists and journalists expressed their outrage and horror over the attack, calling for accountability. A year ago, Israel bombed a hospital. There was an international outcry, so a bunch of media and political figures ran cover for them. Now they're just burning people alive in hospitals with zero pretext or effort to cover it all up, one person wrote on X. The occupation Twitter. army burned human beings alive in their tents. These were patients with IVs still in their arms, trapped and helpless in tents in front of the hospital. This is a holocaust. Hossam Shabbat, a Gaza journalist who has been covering Israeli assaults for over a year, wrote. Imagine the media coverage if another country burned people alive like this. History will show that Western news organizations utterly fell Palestinians. Journalist uh, Ale Leia al Aran, Arian commented online. The attacks on the hospital triggered accusations of Western media double standards following the sympathetic coverage of Israeli troops killed in a rocket strike on Sunday night, but an absence of focus on the civilian victims on the Al Qaeda Martyrs Hospital massacre. Sky News in particular garnered widespread criticism after an unprecedented, unprecedented TV report where they named four Israeli soldiers killed in the Hezbollah strike on a military base near Haifa. I don't know if you have, I don't know if you have the other Sky News stuff that they did with this. No. Where they used no. the pictures of the burning tents and then talked mm -hmm. about like, it blamed oh, that Hezbollah. somehow on Iran, right? Like, right. Uh, yeah, it was a. A fucking really shitty journalistic thing to do. Um, but yeah, not um, great. The report came just hours after the strike on the hospital, and as harrowing videos were shared on social media showing the carnage. Yep. Um, so this is a tweet from, if you can zoom in, please. Yes, I can. Um, from Dr. from at Shola Moss One. The double standard is sickening. How dare media cons const constantly humanize murderous, genocidal IDF soldiers with names age, but deny Palestinians and Lebanese they murder the same humanity? Where is daily roll call of names of thousands of Palestinian children, women, men, IDF bastards killed? Um, so this was in response to Sky News uh, tweet where they reported on the four IDF soldiers that were killed in the Hezbollah strike. Uh, yeah. that were named, but obviously we do not know, well, we know a couple of names of the Palestinian um, patients who uh, who were martyred uh, in this um, in this fire over the weekend. Yeah. Um, Palestinians and pro-Gaza commentators demanded Western media name the victims of Israeli attacks in Gaza, particularly those who were killed in the hospital fire. 
Why are the names of the four Israeli soldiers killed while engaged in armed warfare shared on national British television, but not Palestinian civilians? What possible answer is there other than that Palestinian life is judged to have very little worth? UK-based journalist and activist Owen Jones commented. Also, who is Sky News owned by? Murdoch. Yep. So, yeah, that's why. Mm -hmm. um, and we, you did a segment on him. About <laughs> yes, I did. Ago. Uh, him and his pal Piers, Piers Morgan. Morgan. Yeah. You can find that segment uh, in our playlist. Um, zoom in, please. So this is yes, from well, from at Lale Khalili. Um, why do I have to know the name of four Israeli soldiers killed in a military operation? Why does Sky not read out the name of the Palestinian person displaced multiple times into a tent and burned alive last night in Israeli bombings? Um, yeah, so again, just more attention to the Israeli soldiers that were killed, but not the Palestinians that were burned. Yeah. Um, the strike comes as Israel continues its ground and aerial offensive on northern and central Gaza with civilians in effect, effectively barred from exiting and entering the besieged territory as its indiscriminate attacks on the area continue. No hospitals or ambulances are working in the north, leaving injured and sick without any assistance from emergency services or doctors. In recent days, Palestinians in the north, particularly in Jab Jabalaya, have been taking to social media to call for help and awareness of the massacres taking place, saying civilians are being annihilated and exterminated. Exposed person for Gaza's government media center, Ishmael al-Tobata, said on Sunday, Israeli occupation is committing massacres in the northern governorates, where more than 300 people have been martyred in nine days during a ground attack and the ongoing genocide. He also noted that Israel is trying to continue forcibly displacing Palestinians in northern Gaza, describing it as the largest and most dangerous American-Israeli plan in the 21st century. Many civilians are trapped under the rubble as Israel continues its bombardment and on-ground offensive in northern Gaza. Yeah, um, which they're now starting to settle. Sounds like. Right. So, yep. Actually, I have a little bit more this. The UN Special Rapporteur for the Occupied Palestinian Territory, Francesca Albanese, denounced the attacks on the North as another massacre. She said Palestinians in Jabalia are killed in both groups and one by one amid unspeakable cruelty and sadism, sadism by Israeli troops who have accepted to be willing executioners of a genocidal plan. Seven World Health Organization missions have also been blocked by Israel from reaching the North in recent days, the UN said. Uh, the World Food Program, the UN Food Agency, reported that no food aid has reached northern Gaza since the beginning of this month, 1st of October, with fears the civilian population there is being starved to death. So we're actually going to get to that mm -hmm. later because that's more of the update um, in regards to uh, news that was reported on this issue uh, yesterday. However... While the main assault is on the north, Israel is also striking other areas across the Gaza Strip. Israel's war in Gaza has killed at least 42,289 Palestinians in Gaza and wounded over 98,600 others. The war has utterly devastated the Gaza Strip, plunging it into a deep humanitarian crisis. No, it's not a humanitarian crisis. Yeah, it's a like, genocide. It's a genocide. Say that, please. Um, yeah. um, any thoughts before we get I mean, a little deeper into this? Other than almost uncontrollable rage, uh, <laughs> not much. Like, unfortunately, par for the course. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's especially chilling footage, but yes, I mean, it's been happening, we've been witnessed. To it multiple times now you know mm -hmm. i think i saw someone said that there's not a house in gaza that hasn't lost people so right at this point yeah you know so 
I mean, I, I keep waiting for someone to do something about it. That would be nice. Well, well, we'll get into that. Um, yeah, because the Democrats are doing something in the guise, quote unquote, of doing right. something, but it's literally just nothing. Um, but I do want to kind of go into you pulled this up for me. Yeah. Um, so this was one of the clips that went viral. So obviously we can't play the video. But you can see the picture there. Yeah, but this is a young man that we were seeing in that horrific uh, clip um, that you probably saw on Twitter. So if you go up, um, this is Shaban Ahmad Al Abdul, who Alou, was I think. burned alive. Yeah, huh? Shaban Ahmad Al Dulu, I think. Al Dulu, yeah, who was burned alive by Israel yesterday had just fulfilled his dream of joining medical school a month before the war broke out. Just days ago, he wrote, I had never seen in my life seen anything more terrifying than the thought of a person's death, their disappearance in a single moment, their sudden escape, and the possibility of their return. The human mind, with all of its vivid imagination and capacity for understanding and creation, stands helpless before this absence. Were enough for God's mercy upon us, for our faith that this is his decree and our acceptance of it, we would surely lose our sanity. So, as you said, he was 19, um, you know, had a bright future, uh, you know, got accepted to medical school, I guess, apparently top one great student. And I think he was doing yeah. somewhere I heard also computer engineering. That's why like I also a, heard too. So, not, so yeah. a crazy GPA, like yeah, you know, real really bright kid, right? So, um, uh, so another tweet from Martyrs of Gaza. Heartbreaking. Yesterday wasn't the first time Shaban cried out for the world's help as Israel burned him alive. He had been pleading for the world to save him because he was the sole provider for his family. Now he's gone, leaving behind two sisters and little brother with no one to care for him. Uh, don't let his story be forgotten. Listen to Siobhan's words. So if you want to play that, we'll get to hear what he has. Hello from the tent where we reside. I'm Shaban Ahmad, 19 years old. I'm a student studying software engineer. In this barbaric starvation war, we have displaced five times so far. Now we are in Al-Aqsa Martyrs Hospital in the middle of Gaza, Dir al -Bala. Uh, I'm taking care of my family as I'm the oldest. I have two sisters and two little brothers and uh, my parents. We live in a very hard circumstances, suffering from various uh, things such as, such as uh, homelessness and uh, limited food and uh, extremely uh, limited medicine. And uh, the only things between us and the freezing temperature is uh, this tent that we constructed by ourselves. Uh, I made this uh, campaign to restart a new life in Egypt and uh, evacuate. Thank you. That noise, by the way, I do believe is drone, probably. Yeah. More like sure. I mean, it's just God. sad. <laughs> you know? Like... Hello from you know, I mean, their their only chance, right? He's asking to leave at this point. Right. They're being forced out. And, this is what couldn't. ethnic cleansing looks like. You know, they're making it inhospitable to live there. That is the point. So, um, Tamar Nasir also brings up another point, which leads into our next bit. There's absolutely nothing that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris can do. No death toll high enough. No amount of footage of scattered limbs and dead children that will change the liberal mind into believing that they are not the lesser evil. For liberals, the lesser evil is simply the one more ca capable of leading the empire with a facade of decorum on the world stage. It is not the crime that liberals oppose, but how it's packaged. So, yeah. So basically... A piece of shit with a gold bow on it, basically, mm -hmm. is the the picture I get. Um, 
dealing with the Democrats. So, as I said, there was an update uh, to this story. So, finally, and I say finally in quotations, uh, the U.S. is actually planning to do the business at, well, we'll see. I'll, well, you know, we'll see when it hap if it happens. Um, so, they are calling for 30 days to making a 30 day ultimatum for Israel to because there's been no aid that's been coming into Gaza, which we've been knew this forever. Uh, Blinken has known this forever, so technically, I mean, Blinken. Blinken should be arrested right now. Uh, no. he's not, no, nope. um, so. So if he knew, then this administration knew, but they didn't do shit. So now they're basically like, you have 30 days to ensure that aid is going to get into Gaza. Otherwise, we may, and I'm saying may because, you know, <laughs> because they're saying within 30 days. So the election is in 20 days. So right. it's just a... A shitty crumb. I can't even call it that. But like, you know, just to, I can't even say saving face because they can do something yesterday. So, so I'm not sure what the idea is in terms of, um, them giving them 30 days to actually help okay, them. Geez. But basically, the idea of like we'll feed you before we'll kill you some more. So yeah, I mean, that's basically the idea that they're saying right now. They're playing election um, clock games, pretty much. You know? Right. So, um, I forgot what uh, news program this is, but I know it's based in Australia. Like ABC Australia. News, Australia. Um, so they talk about this, funny enough, because it's Australia talking about American politics. Mm -hmm. um, but they're going to talk about this ultimatum, this shitty ultimatum. Um, and then, yeah, we'll wrap it up from here. The U.S. has given Israel 30 days to improve access to desperately needed aid in Gaza or face cuts in military funding. It's the strongest known warning from the Biden administration to its ally and comes as Israel significantly ramps up its action in the region. The UN says just 80 trucks carrying aid have been made into Gaza so far this month and the US reportedly wants to see that number rise to 350 a day. Let's go straight to Global Affairs Editor John Lyons in Beirut. John, good morning. What is Washington saying to Israel about Gaza? Well, Stephanie, the White House has written a a letter to Israel tonight and telling them that they have a deep sense of urgency about the humanitarian crisis. What has triggered this has been a heavy bombing for now 12 days around the Jabalia refugee camp in the north of the Gaza Strip. Oxfam and eyewitnesses reporting people being burnt alive, women and children being burnt alive. The Israeli army appears to have now encircled about 300,000 people in that area. They're getting no food, no water, no medicines. And the United States is saying this can't go on. They've given 30 days. However, the really odd thing about this is that it's American bombs that are doing most of the bombing. So it's an unusual situation, to say the least, that America is saying you can continue to drop our bombs for another 30 days, but within those 30 days, you must improve the humanitarian situation. You must let more aid into a desperate Gaza. So what in particular is prompting this toughening in US rhetoric? I think that the pictures coming out of the Jabalia refugee camp, 12 days of bombing, I think that now with groups like the UN, Oxfam and others, um, and doctors and American doctors um, and others who've been there have been writing to the White House saying it is beyond disaster what's going on in Gaza after a year. They're saying that it just can't continue. France, of course, only two weeks ago talked about an arms embargo. There was a backlash against them. But I think also with the election coming up in the United States, I think that Kamala Harris realises there's several states in America where there's a significant Arab American population, such as Michigan. And they have been saying to the Democrats, we will not turn up on election day in protest at what your support for the Israeli operation in Gaza. I think those are the factors that are behind it. And in Lebanon, where you are, Hezbollah has suggested that it is prepared to enter a ceasefire with Israel. Why would Hezbollah be saying that? 
Well, Stephanie, a another intriguing aspect here of the United in the Middle East. Naim Qasem, the deputy of Hezbollah, um, has put out a video to tonight where he's it's a mixed message. He's saying, on the one hand, we can inflict more pain on Israel. That's his word. Um, and we will do that if we have to. But the really significant thing is that he's saying, let's talk about a ceasefire. It's the second time he's brought that up in a, in a week. Now, what it says to me is that Hezbollah is seriously on the defensive. Militarily, Israel is winning this new war with Hezbollah, with the southern no, Lebanon, not. the heavy bombing of the southern suburbs of Beirut behind me. A lot of the command of Hezbollah has been killed, uh, including Hassan Nasrallah, the leader. I think Hezbollah needs to regroup. And I think that's why they are now talking about the prospect of a ceasefire. Yeah, except we know Israel has said they won't talk about a ceasefire. So right. which one is it, dog? Um, I have one more to bring for this. Um, okay. Which I forgot to bring up for a while ago. And I forgot I had it. And then I was like, oh, that would be good. Um, let me pull it up. So this is from, hold on, there we go. Um, so this is from, oh, yeah. oh, you seen this, I take it, um, yes. from Scar Poetry. Um, and I wish I knew who this woman was to actually credit her. So if someone knows, please tell me. But I figured her words were, uh, you know, very fitting. I've been trying to write about. Hold on. Can you turn it up? Yeah. Yep. I've been trying to write about Congo. Trying to write about Palestine. But I feel so inadequate. I've been trying to write about Sudan, but my, my, my heart, what could I say? What could possibly be enough? How do I feed the cry of 12,000 dead Palestinian children in my throat? How do I speak for the dead? And if you do not hear them, how will you hear me? I've been trying to write about Congo, but tears fill my eyes. No sound comes from my mouth. I've been trying to write about war to ask myself who benefits from this. Viva, viva Congo. You will be free. This poem will not be enough. But after sinking into hopelessness, I have decided to do my little. This poem is my little. This poem is only five minutes long. It cannot compact the 30 years of war that have been going on in the Congo. It cannot tell you the story of thousands of people who have lost their lives to that war. It cannot tell you the story of countless children who have been maimed in cobalt mines within the Congo. And as you use your newest iPhone, this poem can only ask you, did you know it was made using cobalt? Did you know that children as young as six years old are forced to work in cobalt mines within the Congo? Did you know you can never fully escape the consequences of war? Not even when you escape your war-torn country, ask the Congolese refugees living in Mwiki. They'll tell you they die in their houses too, afraid to seek medical attention because they do not have documentation. This country has labeled them illegal, illegal. How does a person become illegal? Imagine your very existence being against the law. My mother once asked me, why don't they ever go back home? Don't they have family to visit in Congo? When your country lives in a state of war, your family is not guaranteed their right to life. In light of all this, what does a poem do? What can a poem do? But express my own outrage at war. Say, I stand with Congo, I stand with Palestine. We can never be free unless they too are free. But perhaps this poem awakens you.
makes you uncomfortable. I hope it grieves you. I hope it makes your heart heavy because this are not light times. Countries cannot be in war for over 30 years and we stand and do nothing. I hope this pain does not leave you. Not until it leaves the Palestinians, not until it leaves the Congolese, not until Sudan too is free. Because who benefits from a war? Not the soldiers. Did you know that some Israeli soldiers posted to fight in the IOF and alive themselves? Refusing to be complicit in a genocide, they would rather take their own lives. So who benefits from this war? Not the children maimed and killed before they could walk. Imagine having no room to think or dream of a future. What do you want to be when you grow up? I just hope I grow up. What do you pray for? My duas are suffocated with prayers of peace. They leave room for nothing else. The cry of Congo is the cry of the Palestinians. It is my cry. It is the cry of all of us under the thumb of neocolonialism, patriarchy, capitalism. Oye, oye. Set us free. Set yourselves free. A threat to justice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere lately. I find myself wanting to pray in Arabic. Maybe Allah will hear me and set the Palestinians free and as we free Palestine. Do not forget Congo. Do not forget Sudan. Oh, Madiba. The Palestinians are still not free. Sankara. Your country lies in ruins, Lumumba. We are still dying for Africa. And this is why I always say that foreign policy is domestic policy. When we mm -hmm. are... Um, criticizing immigrants. Now, granted, do I believe that they should be getting all the benefits over people who've lived here? No, I don't necessarily agree with that, but I am not going to chastise an immigrant for getting the services that I argue they deserve in light of what our elite are espousing on their countries that they are forced to come here. And then our government thinks, okay, well, if we give them everything they need, then that's a base that will like us. We'll get into that later in terms of the Democratic Party and Black men because they don't like us either. So, so to all those assholes online, especially <clears throat> the black people online that really should know better, but because we do not teach about foreign history, foreign policy, or anything foreign at all, you know, in our media and really in our schools, we're so, you know, isolated to what we do here does have ripple effects everywhere, especially within the global South. You know, we're fighting each other. Meanwhile, the political elite are laughing at us and basically are saying, you dumb motherfuckers. We are robbing you blind, and yet still you choose to point fingers at each other for the blame and the cause of your suffering. So she's right. And, but given... Yeah, I mean, again, I, it's been hard yeah. to keep doing this every week and to kind of hear another fucking Israeli-based, Gaza-based story every goddamn week. And, you know, and nothing is changing. Nothing is happening. 
And I think people are just like, oh, well, well, we need to vote for Kamala or Trump or whoever because, you know, I care about, like, abortion. I care about, you know, X issue. And are willing to step over Palestinians and by and like we don't talk about this at all. You're willing to step over African nations for your comfort. Well, mm -hmm. I argue, as said this before, I said this on Twitter. I'm sure I've said this here. If you're worried about your rights taken away, they're not rights to begin with, because rights are something that you should have on the basis that you exist. So. If you have rights, then everybody should have rights. You can name what they are. So you're being fucking selfish if you believe that Kamala is going to save you from the little rights that, and it's not a right at all, it's, more, it's a privilege. Yeah, it's a little and... privilege that they're giving you to appease you that they themselves can easily take away given the proper opportunity and same thing on the other side they're both shit you know i i, I forget where i heard it but it's like the uh, you know the the lesser evil of today is more evil than the lesser evil of yesterday uh, right well, yes where it's like Challenge JB, yeah i shared that i think it was another tiktok that jb shared uh, yeah. i believe last week so yeah, it's, you know, because even Republicans back in the day, and it wasn't with BB, but with the Israeli mm -hmm. government, they were like... They pushed back on it a little bit. They pushed back on it hard. So how is it that even Republicans managed to get that right somewhat, and Democrats can't? Yeah. So... It's just, uh, you know, I feel for that lady, because I'm with you. It's just exhausting to have to cover atrocity every day, you know? Mm -hmm. And granted, I feel bad for feeling bad because I'm not the one experiencing that atrocity, you know? Right. Like, or it's just, just hard, you know? So um, hard for everybody. But, and hopefully there's some change soon or worse things will happen. So right. anyway, right. You know, <sighs> talking about these things, why we're demonetized. If you haven't figured that out, um, you can scan this QR code. Give us a little dollary dues. Help keep us running. Go to kodashp.com slash indie news network. You know, links always in the description below. If you can't give monetarily, supposedly all that algorithm stuff, liking and subscribing, sharing the video, commenting, all that's supposed to help. So we appreciate all that. You know, help us help us get some more people here. Otherwise, thanks for watching.